Okay, good evening everybody. Tonight's Shia is entitled um, Egypt Today. So I'll tell you what the Shia isn't about. The Shia is not really talking about modern day Egypt. The Shia is really talking about how Egypt is, as a culture and as a Weltanschung, as a world view, is very much alive and well in our present day world. I, I once thought that society has no truer mirror than its advertising. If you look at TV ads, principally, and also print ads, an ad really expresses the, the true desire of what that society really wants. They spend vast amounts of money on advertising for a couple of minutes. Proportionately, I'm guessing, but I would assume that the amount of money invested in thinking about the idea, refining the phrase, the uh, slogan, the product approach, the demographic, all of that incredible crea creativity has to be tailored to something which is ultimately going to make money. <clears throat> and I think it's axiomatic that what people are prepared to put in their hands into their pockets and pull out their hard-earned cash for really represents something very fundamental to them, very independent to them. And therefore, the way you want to try and get the money out of those people's pockets is to give them, appeal to them with visuals and images and uh, dreams, if you like, which are going to appeal to, um, to that deepest um, desire that they have, that society has. So um, I, it seems to me that maybe a very true reflection of society's true moral values are expressed in what advertisers will use in order to attract uh, people to, to uh, buy their product. And if you think about it, much of advertising is about getting away from it, escapism. If you think about it, that, um, you know, you have all these ads out in the desert there with some four-wheel drive, you can go anywhere you want, you can go everywhere you want, there's nothing holding you back, you're totally free. That's like a, a dream, the vast American Midwest, the, not the Midwest, <laughs> the, the Wild West, the, the whole idea of the Wild West, the you know, paragliding, uh, some completely deserted, beautiful golden beach with nothing but palm trees, some private island off, off the coast of Curaçao or somewhere. And some, this, is, this is really what, if you want to sell a chocolate bar, you want to latch into that. But eat this chocolate bar and you'll be, you'll be free. You'll be as free as somebody who's driving this Ferrari down this beautiful coast road in Monte Carlo. Buy this uh, soap powder and, and uh, you know, you'll be able to escape. You'll have this wonderful film star life where... Right? I, I mean, I think, unfortunately, we all know what I'm talking about, that advertising really plugs in to what people really want. And the reason why that is is because, you know... There's gold in the Andar Hills, as they say. That's where the money is. That's the mother load. If you can plug into what people's deepest desires are, you can convince them. You can then, you know, schlep that across to the fact that if you use this particular soap powder, you will be a Hollywood star and you'll have, you know, whatever. Okay, I think the point's clear. But I was thinking, you know, a lot of a common theme, not, not in all ads, but a common theme of many ads is this idea of... Uh, the idea of being a freedom. I want to do what I want, when I want, and I can change what I want from one moment to the next. In other words, if one could sum it up, the, the, the commitment to being uncommitted. My life should be a constant uh, scenario, frame after frame of, of, of escapism. I can go here, I can go there, I can do this, I can do that, nothing's holding me back. That is a, that's a very appealing um, image that it seems to me permeates as a theme that runs through a lot of, of advertising. And again, the advertising doesn't have to be for a getaway holiday necessarily, but the getaway holiday will be used, that idea of escapism, of, of freedom, of total lack of commitment, of, 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 of a kind of uh, going with the flow, do what I want, 
that'll sell chocolate bars, it'll sell soap powder, it'll sell anything you want. So really, if you think about it, society pays lip service to the, what they would call the Judeo-Christian ethic of commitment, stability, fidelity. But if you look at, excuse me, advertising, you'll see that's really not what people are really interested in. In, at large, society at large. I'm not talking about individuals. Of course, individuals, there is as many, there, individuals are totally individual and every different person has. But it seems to me that what advertising represents something about the society itself, how society uh, frames its values. And it seems to me that the common theme, as I've been trying to uh, put across to you, is this idea of the column, common aspiration is to go with the flow. Take it easy, chill hang out, freedom. But unfortunately, modern man finds his flow severely restricted. At every turn, he's in, encumbered by commitments. Mm -hmm. A house, a home, a spouse, children, a mortgage, a second mortgage, a second spouse. All of these things tie a person down to what we would rather not face, which is called reality. But what a person would really want to do, and that's expressed in advertising, is he'd like to take off, travel the world with an unlimited credit card facility and to follow any or all of a myriad possibilities. In other words, the fact that, that in, in the modern secular world we, we tolerate responsibility doesn't mean that we've accepted that as, as, a, as a, a value system. Really, underneath it all, there's the desire to be somewhere else, anywhere else, everywhere else. Where does this ideology of irresponsibility come from? Where, is its, where are its roots? Many years ago, I was in the States, and uh, you'll probably be able to tell me where this is. There is the, uh, the Warner Brothers store. I think it was somewhere in Manhattan. Warner Brothers store. I went in there. It was absolutely amazing. You know, my, all my childhood memories coming back to life. You know, they had original animation cells of the lady and the tramp. They had, uh, they were, I think, a mere, 500, mere $500 at the time, probably about four times the price by now. The original cells, you know, like the animation cells, the picture itself, the celluloid. A Batmobile that looked so real that you could get a parking ticket for it. Bugs Bunny, ashtrays, pajamas, cookie jars. I've never seen a store so full of things that I didn't need. I think it was probably 50 years ago now that Canadian sociologist Marshall McLuhan coined the phrase, the medium is the message. The medium is the message. The medium is the, so to speak, the... Uh, the way things are transmitted, communicated. And the message, clearly, is the message. In other words, what he said was that, basically, in Western society, uh, it's probably equally, if not more important, the way you say something, the way you put it across, the way you dress it up, is almost as important, and maybe more important, than actually what you're saying. I mean, it was amazing at the time when Ronald Reagan, who was basically a... I'm not judging Reagan as a, as a, uh, as a, as a politician or a, a, a president, but his pedigree, where he came from, he was a former B-movie actor. And the fact that a B-movie actor could become the most powerful man in the world was... Why was that? Because he had the, as they say, he had the teeth and the hair. That's what they want in a, a, a newscaster. It's not the, the, the method, the, me, the, the presentation, the wrapping of the box becomes as important and what becomes problematic ultim ultimately is it becomes the box itself, it becomes the contents. We've talked about this in previous times, but man has this tremendous predilection to throw away the, the, uh, the contents and, and rejoice around the wrapping. It's interesting, you see with kids often, you buy them a present, they get more involved with the wrapping than the actual toy you give them. 
could be that because there's more creativity that's uh, available with uh, the boxes and but it also I think that there's a certain that man has this this unfortunate uh, tendency to to latch on to what we call in Hebrew the tofel, the, the what's subsidiary, what's non-essential, and to ignore, discard, or overlook the essential. Let us um, go into this in a bit more detail, the idea of the medium and the message. The medium, the and we would say the 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 the, the, the material <coughs> the way things are framed and what they're actually saying. Let us go back and let's take our Chumashim right back to the very, very beginning of the Torah. Very first posseg in the Torah. Bereshit is bar lukim es ha-shamayim in the beginning of God's creating the heavens and the earth, Vaharetz and the land, Hayisa so vo vachoshech al sahom. And the land, the world, was sohu, vohu, two words which we'll talk about in a second, vachoshech al sahom, and darkness upon the face of the deep. Now, these two words, to and vo, are translated totally inadequately into English. <coughs> uh, the art scroll says the verse was astonishingly empty. The Ramban says, actually, these are two stages, distinct stages of creation. To or vo. Let me preface this by saying, as we started our discussion about the medium and the message, everything in the physical world is a marriage of form and matter of the message which is if you like the form the form of something describes what's its purpose it's the message and the matter the chomer is the way that that purpose that Message expresses itself, or was allowed. It, it gives it the, the, the ability, the, the possibility of being expressed in concrete terms. In Hebrew, these are called chomer v'tsura, material and shape, the medium and the message. Matter is the raw material. Form molds that matter to give it a specific shape. The form, as we said, the shape of something is its spiritual component. It reveals its purpose. The purpose of something is always connected with its spiritual... Everything in this world has a spiritual component, even, even physical things. By spiritual, I mean... Spiritual means that it has a, a, a purpose. It's there for a reason. It doesn't just exist. The world of the spirit deals with purpose. What's it all about? What am I doing here? So even something as, uh, let's say, simple as a spoon... It's a marriage of these two things. There's the metal, and there's the shape. The shape describes what it is that the metal has been shaped into this form for. It's to stir. It's to eat your cornflakes with. It's its purpose. It's its spiritual component. So even something as basic as a spoon, something very physical as a spoon, has basically a spiritual component to it. When Hashem first created the world, He created something called tohu. So, the Ramban says, is unformed, pure matter, pure choma, without any kind of shape whatsoever. Pure physical matter from which, at this point, no purpose could be defined. No shape could be defined. Its spiritual dimension was not yet revealed. In other words, all choma, all, all physic, pure physical matter, contains within it the myriad potential of everything that you might be able to form from it. Yes? Um, so you're saying so that the, the wrapping or the shape, whatever, um, describes the, the purpose and the spiritual component. So what does the, the choma describe? It? Just how effective it's going to be in that purpose? No, the, there has to be a marriage of the two. 
The Choma is the <coughs> raw physical material which allows the spiritual, the purpose to be actualized in the world. Like a spoon, for example. A spoon is a perfect example. A spoon is basically metal. Right. Metal, is, metal is what? Metal is metal. Metal contains within it an infinite number of possibilities. But once it's made into a spoon, it's now re- its per- spiritual, quote-unquote, purpose is revealed. Purpose and spirituality, I'm, I'm saying, they're basically the same thing. Okay, fine, yeah. But I'm saying, well, let's say, like, with the example of a spoon, it could get, it could get like, confusing because um, you could have the same shape a metal spoon and a, uh, a wooden spoon. True. Right, or a plastic spoon. Right. And they can have similar but but different purposes. Okay, but then the purposes would be slightly different one from the other. For example, you not wouldn't... Not really significant enough. Say again? Not, not significant enough to... I mean, I'm, I'm just using it as a mashal, as a, as, a, as a parable to show how the marriage of, of matter and form, of choma and tzura works out in the real world, that everything, everything in the world really is, if you think about it, a marriage of these two things. Right, but I'm saying, but, but, well, okay, from one man to another, are you going to say that they have different shapes or the same shape? Can, maybe we can leave this to one side and I'll come back to it. Okay. So, the Ramban says that, <clears throat> as we said, Hashem first of all brought into existence something called to. Tol means unformed, totally unformed matter where nothing can be discerned in it. And the Ramban says that the ancient Greeks had a word for this. They called it chiuli, a Greek word. The Torah calls it tohu. And this was really the very first dot of creation, pure matter, ungarbed by form. Now, it's interesting because the word to, Rashi says, is connected to the word to, uh, for regret or wonder or to be amazed. Why? Because if you were trying to give this formless substance a name, you would immediately, so to speak, regret your, def- your, your, your decision, your definition, because you say, no, it's not really that. Well, maybe it's, no, it's not really that. <coughs> Excuse me. At this point of creation, it's impossible to distinguish anything to do with form. It just is this raw, totally raw material. And therefore you go on and on. The second name you'd also regret is insufficient to really describe what it is, and so another, and another, and another, and another, because this elemental matter called toe could not be garbed with a name. As it had no form, its purpose was yet undefined, it could not have a name. <coughs> to <coughs> excuse me, represents p- unactualized potential. Okay. Do they, do they have a spiritual component as well? No, and the spiritual component was as yet hidden. It hadn't yet emerged. Then the second step is vo. Vo is really when form starts to emerge. And if you think of it, the word, the Ramban's vo is bo. Who? Bo, in it, who? There is. In it, there is. It's possible to start saying there is something here to define a recognizable form. So, just to go over it again, everything in this world then we're saying is a combination of matter and form, of choma v'tsura, and by definition, matter has no form. It has an infinite number of latent forms of different shapes. Matter, ungarbed by form, has unlimited potential uses. In a world which is all chomer, all matter, everything is possible. Nothing is fixed. You can go with the flow. Does this start to sound familiar? Sound familiar? The epitome of matter, ungarbed by form, is water. Water always takes the form of the container it's in. By definition, water has no tsura. Water, so to speak, <coughs> is the <coughs> archetypical example of chomer li tsura, matter without form. And for that reason, the Hebrew word for water is maim, and maim is a plural noun. There's no Water can never be singular. 
water is the essence of plurality. Many, 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 many possibilities. <clears throat> now, if you remember something about what we'll get to Egypt, the Egyptians worshipped the Nile. The Nile, obviously, was water. What does this mean on a deeper level? What was the Egyptian... Of course, on a, on a simple level, they worshipped the Nile because the Nile gave them sustenance. It was only through the Nile that they were able to grow their crops. But a on a deeper level, plurality. it represents plurality. It represents going with the flow. It represents unrestricted matter. <coughs> The desire not to be pinned down. Freedom to do whatever you want. You can do whatever you want. You can change whatever you want. You're not tied to anybody. And that's why Egypt, excuse me, was an, an entire society, society dedicated to the pursuit of infinite, infinite variety. And of course, by definition, by definition, such a society is incapable of and scorns marital fidelity. Every Friday night we sing <coughs> a song called Eishes Chayil. On a deeper level, Shlomo Melech was talking about the Eishes Chayil, the woman of valor in, in a deeper sense, the role of the woman and the role of the man are very different. The role of the woman is the role of Chomer. A woman is much more connected to the physical side of existence than a man. Life, in its most physical sense, comes from the body of a woman. A man is more connected to what we would call the tzura, the shape of things. The Yeshus Chayil is the representation of Chomer that accepts willingly the tzura. The Yeshus Chayil is the, is the wife who understands that her job is to accept the tzura, which is given to her by her husband. That is the ashes, that is the perf, that's the idea of Jewish marriage. The man in the family is responsible to create the tzura, and the woman is, is responsible to take that theoretical, sometimes ungrounded um, spirituality and to bring it down to earth. I think they talk in other cultures of the earth mother. That's a Jewish idea. The woman in the house con gives conc concretizes, gives definite... Well, no, she, she is ma'af she, she She gives pos the possibility for the shape to exist. Shape cannot exist by itself. As formed by itself, it has nothing to hold on to. That is the, the idea of a Jewish marriage, the perfect synthesis of shape and material, form and matter. The Aishas Zanunim, the faithless wife, was Egypt. The faithless wife that is Egypt is basically, and this is the point I want to get to, is Chomer, is matter, that perceives itself to be form. And by definition, therefore, it seeks infinite variety. Rather than the Eishas Chayel, who understands that she is the Chomer that must be faithful to the Tzura that's given by her husband, the Eishas Nunim, the whole culture of Egypt, is about this relentless, insatiable desire to be, and now this, now this, that is the way things are supposed to be. That is Chomer perceiving itself as form. It doesn't need form. Because that's, that's what form is. Form is infinite variety, infinite infidelity. Another wife every day, to put it nicely. <coughs> A new partner. Does this sound familiar to you? Does this sound rather similar to another society, which we're a little bit more familiar with? In constant as water, she wants to go with the flow. And as I said, maybe just give me a little... In diametrical opposition to this culture stands the Jewish home and in Chazal refer to a wife as a bayit. The home is the wife. The Jewish home represents the unique, ultimate triumph of matter expressed in form. 
sorry, right, of matter expressed in form. The form has been faithful to represent, to take that, sorry, the other way around, the choma has been faithful to the form that has been given to it. The Eishis Chayel, the woman of valor, is able to concretize and limit this incessant potential and give it unchanging stability. Yes, I'll take your question. Um, why is it that, why is it that because Chomer perceives himself as having Sura, that that um, makes it want to go and pursue? Um... Because Homer has infinite potential. Okay. If Homer, if a society which understands that that is the Tzura, that's the way things are supposed to be. Oh, the, the, the infinite potential itself Inf- is the Infinite potential is its Tzura. <coughs> it refuses to accept to, so to speak, it's, 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 a, it's a travesty of the relationship between Tzura and Choma, between form and matter. The ideal, the Eishis Chayel, represents the, the Choma actualizing, concretizing, and accepting that Tzura of the husband. The infidelity, the Eishis Nunim, perceives herself to be that infinite potential that's there within Choma, that, that's the way things are supposed to be. So like see, seeing themselves as having a tzura, and what is that tzura? Unlimited Right, potential. right, exactly. The cornerstone of our belief, let's talk now a little bit about the mezuzah, and how the mezuzah plugs into this. The cornerstone of our belief in God's constant involvement and guidance of this world is through the exodus from Egypt. I think a, a while ago we, <coughs> we learned the famous Ramban at the end of Pasha's boy, which I very much, I may do it next week if you want, or we'll see, I have to think about it, but it's certainly something that you should learn before the Seder night. It really tells you what the Seder night is all about. And basically the way that we relate to God's constant involvement in this world is through remembering the experience of Yitzhak Mitzrayim. And one of the days we internalize that belief throughout the generations is by fixing a mezuzah to our doorpost. Now it's interesting, in the two paragraphs of the Torah that constitute the mezuzah, if you open it up, you will find there's not one word about the Exodus. Which is counterintuitive. Doesn't say anything about the Exodus. Well, it says he brought us from Egypt. Where? In Mishnah. Where about? Show me, please. In the, in, the, in the first paragraph, the first. Oh, it's only the first paragraph. It's only the first two paragraphs. Oh, I didn't know that. If the job of the mezuzah is to implant in us a steadfast faith in the miracles of Egypt, shouldn't the, the Exodus be mentioned at least once? When Kalis were about to leave Egypt, the Jewish people were about to leave Egypt, God commanded them to place the blood of the Pesach offering on the doorposts and their lintels. Why the doorposts? Why the doorposts? He obviously knew which houses were Jewish and which were not. Remember, that was to allow, so to speak, the, that he would skip over. He would, Pesach comes from the root to, to leap. Pesach, which means an opening, also as this comes from the same root in Hebrew as the word to, to skip, to leap, to jump. The Torah teaches that the God, so to speak, leapt over, passed over the entrances of the Jewish homes in Egypt. Now what has to be understood here is that the exodus from Egypt was not merely a physical exodus. It was no less than a leap from one worldview to another. Two totally distinct, totally irreconcilable views of the world. A leap from a world of the Ashes Zanunim, of unbridled matter, to a world of form, where matter accepts that form. And ironically and inevitably, if you think about it, this leap takes place when? while the Jewish people are immobilized in their homes. The Pesach says, and you may not leave your house until morning. 
the place of that leap, the place that takes place where they're immobilized in the home. The mezuzah doesn't talk about Nitzius Mitzrayim because the mezuzah represents the rite of passage from one reality to another. The blood of the Korban Pesach that was daubed on those doorposts and the lintels, what's left of the, that blood is the mezuzah. The mezuzah represents the blood of the Korban Pesach. And that metamorphosis from a world of matter into form has to be in the place of, which is the essence of form, the abode of the Eshes Chayil, the Jewish home. The Pesach, the leap that is in, that's what the Exodus was. The mezuzah does not speak about the Exodus for it is the Exodus. That's what happened. A complete leap from one world to another. The mezuzah marks the border between the street and the home. The street says, go here, go here, go there, do this. You can do that. Everything is possible. You can flow all over the world. That's the street. And our experience of the street, we know everything is possible. You can go anywhere in the street. You can end up anywhere if you keep flowing. Nothing is fixed. The mezuzah stands at the central, as a sentinel at the threshold to the Jewish home and states unequivocally there is no connection between the street and the home. These are two non-contiguous, irreconcilable entities. There's a fascinating halacha about the mezuzah. Now, you know on the outside of a mezuzah, there's what? The, one of Hashem's names, which is spelled Shin and Dalad and Yud, which we, we pronounce as Sha Shadkai. It's really Sha and then Dai, but we don't say it because it's the name of Hashem. It's one of Hashem's names. The Zara Kodesh says that if you, the way the mezuzah has to be written is that on the exact same place, if you unroll the mezuzah and you flip it over, where it says Shadkai on the outside, on the inside, it says Vahoyah. Vahoyah im Shema, I think it is. Vahoyah. Now, Vahoyah is an interesting word. What can you tell me about that, that word? Same letters on Yod Kei Vav Kei. Yod Kei Vav Kei. Shad Kei Yud Kei Vav Kei Bifnim. Shad Kai is the name of limitation. The Kodesh Baruch who created the world and he created it in such a way that the world would have continued, existence would have continued expanding and expanding and expanding, more and more and more and more, until Hashem said, die. Misha Omo La Oma Olam die. The one, he is the one, She said, who said to the Olam, die. Enough. Ad Khan, here. It's the name of limitation. Yud Kei Vav Kei is the name of names, which is without limitation. Meaning, if a person says die enough to the street, let's put one more, one more halacha into this to make it more sense. To make more sense. In Hilchus um, Shabbos, there are things different called Rishuyot, domains. There's the Rishut Harabim, the public domain. And there's another Rishut, there are other Rishiyot, but we just deal with two of them, called the Rishut Hayachid, the Rishut Hayachid. The Rishut HaRabim only extends to about three feet off the ground. About three feet. Horizontally, it can spread out everywhere, but it's limited. It never rises above three feet. That is the Rishut HaRabim, that is Egypt. That's a world of constant possibility. The Rashut Rabbi theoretically could go all over the world. You could go everywhere. But it never ascends. The Rashut Yachid, the public, the, excuse me, the private domain, goes Ad Hashemayim, goes to the heaven. The word Shadkai, on the outside, if we, on the outside, if we use, if we protect our homes on the outside, we leave the street outside, that 
irresistible, so not irresistible, that, ir, ir, um, that um, I forgot the word, the, the, that, that, that desire to, to just more, 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 to spread out, to, to flow. If we say die, that's our mezuzah that stands on the, 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 the gatepost of our homes, which represents the, lump, the, the jump from Mitzrayim and everything it represents to the Jewish home, Bifnim. If we say die to the street, which can never rise up, it can go everywhere, but it'll never rise. Inside the name Yud K Vav K will ascend to the sky. To the extent that we make a limitation to the world, the street, Ad Khan, to here and no farther, you do not pass my threshold, then Yud K Vav K, the ineffable name, with, which is without limitation, will ascend in the person's home, Ad Shemaim. There is no limit to the ascent. That's really basically what I wanted to put across to you tonight. Just maybe pull out the major points. The world we live in, I would like to suggest, is really none other than the inherit than, than Egypt today. We live in a world of infinite possibility, not only possibility, but the 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 Philosophy of today's world is that you, why miss out on it? Why, why you, you need to experience everything. I mean, and if you don't, then in some way you're a little bit weird. I mean, from somebody of my generation now, what's going on out there, I'm not going to go into details, is what's considered to be normal now is, is, such a, is, is, is Egypt, infinite possibility. I mean, you know, it's got to the point now where L-G-B-D-R-S-T-U-V It's just so many letters now in order to... What? It's just, you know, it gets a lot... Every minute there's another letter. You know, it's going to be... Where does it stop? This is infinite variety. This is go with the flow. You don't even need to leave your house anymore. It's like on the computer. Ah, that's what I was trying to say. To the extent that a person makes a demarcation line and he says, I'm not letting the street into my home, then his connection, his spirituality, he makes his home, his Aishas Chayel is not just his wife, it's the atmosphere of his, his, of his home. It's the <laughs> Jewish home which is faithful to Yud Kei Vav Kei. How? Because I have a sentinel on my door. I have a soldier standing at my door saying, die to the street. This is it. Ad Khan. That's it. Because otherwise we're, f- we're, f- we're faced and we see it. That's what, that's what it's all about. Infinite variety. Okay. <laughs>